Okay, hello, my name is Victoria Aguilar, and I'll be recording the life story of Judith Mastro. This recording is happening on June 28, 2019. We're recording in Fresno, California. Before we begin, can I have you state your name, your age, and your preferred pronouns? Okay, um, I am um, Julio, Jules, people call me Jules, Mastro, uh, I am 68 years old, and um, I'm a gay man, I was uh, born and raised in Fresno, and have lived in Los Angeles for a short time and in San Francisco for many years. here? Yes, I was. And what is your cultural background? Italian-American. And you said you've lived in San Francisco and Los Angeles? Yes. Um, and what occupations have you worked in? Uh, I've been mostly in the food and beverage industry. Uh, for many years, I was a uh, wine consultant slash salesperson uh, in retail and wholesale, both here in the Valley and in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And um, after I returned to Fresno, I got involved in some volunteer work with HIV AIDS and I've been working in that field for, since 1990. Um, I'm basically Tired from it, but I still do a few things. Okay, so going back to your everything leading up to that, what was your family background? When and where did you grow up? I grew up just not far from here. Um, my uh, dad was a plumbing contractor, and mom was a, a stay-at-home uh, wife and mother. Uh, which was her profession. She was, uh, she was uh, very dedicated to it and, uh, and uh, uh, very uh, competent. So was it a sort of, a, sort of ideal kind of American family unit? Yeah, it was, you know, we're Italian Americans and um, back during World War II, Italy was aligned with Germany and, and Japan, and uh, Italians weren't allowed to live west of Highway 1 in California because they were afraid that they were going to help the invaders come in and invade America. Um, there was a lot of discrimination uh, towards Italians, um, and My parents and that generation wanted us to be as American as we could be. Uh, they did not allow us to learn the Italian language. Um, everything was English, and um, there was just there was just a, a lot of stuff that. We didn't understand it wasn't spoken about at the time, but as I've gotten older, I've learned more about what was happening then culturally. Um, you know, my dad had uh, three brothers, and uh, him, including himself, they were all uh, in the military during World War II. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, they were a little more respected than, than some Italian families because the because the boys were all in the military. But um, but there was there was discrimination, and there was um, you know uh, both families, both my mother and father's family. Um, you know, the, my grandparents, all four grandparents, immigrated here from Italy. So um, and. Um, my dad's parents, especially, did not were not proficient in English. Um, uh, my mother's grandparents, who uh, 
came uh, over, um, they never did learn English. Um, my grandmother was only nine years old when she came. They came on the Lusitania, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, uh, she was very proficient in English, but, um, you know, she had to quit school at a certain age. She really wanted to go to college, and, uh, you know, it was... It just wasn't what they did. Instead, she married at 16 and had five kids. Um, my dad's father had come to, to America, went back to Italy, married my grandmother, and came back to America. And my grandmother and my dad's sister, who was born in Italy, then they came over to America. So families, uh, my dad's family settled in Rochester, New York, and then they came to Fresno in about 1920. My mother's family settled in Messina, New York, upstate New York, and they came to California in 1938. And your parents met here? My parents met here. Um, my dad was a friend of my mother's brother. Oh. And that's how they met. Um, and he's actually four years younger than my mother and uh, she he kept bugging her to go out with him and she told him he was too young for her and he finally she couldn't stand it anymore and she uh, uh, went out with him and then he stood her up so he, then she told him to go take a flying leap and he begged her and begged her again so she couldn't stand the begging and she went out with him and then they got married ended up getting married wow and so they had a colorful romance. Yeah. So when you were growing up, um, you said you weren't really aware at the time of the discrimination going on. So when you dreamed of what you wanted to be when you grew up, um, uh, how did you think of that or what did you want to be? What did I want to be? Oh, God. I don't know. The first thing I wanted to be was an elevator operator at J.C. Penney's because we'd go in the elevators there and they had like a little cage and you could see all the cables taking the elevators up and down and I just thought that'd be just really cool to be riding on those elevators all day long. You know, I don't know what did I want to be. Um, I was always kind of a sensitive kid and I was the oldest of four boys. Um, you know, my name's Giulio and I was named after my father's father, which is the way Italians would do it. My my brother right after me, his name was Frank, which was the name of my mother's father. Mm. And, um, that's just kind of the, the way things were done. My parents actually spelled it, but again, I said about the discrimination. My grandfather spelled his name G-I-U-L-I-O. When I was born, my parents spelled mine J-U-L-I-O. And I said, why did you spell mine with a J instead of a G? And they said, well, we wanted you to uh, spell it the American way. I said, there is no American way. You spelled it the Spanish name, and now people call me Julio all the time. <laughs> That's what I found confusing when I read your Yeah, name. right. But at any rate, they, that they were trying to honor the tradition, but trying to somehow fit it into the American slot there. Um, but we were, you know, we were pretty traditional. Um, you know, we had uh, we had our pasta twice a week, and um, and uh, you know, it was a big family, and uh, every Sunday at my grandmother's, and uh, lots of cousins and aunts and uncles, and um, uh, and you know, I, mean, I was probably, oh, I don't know, probably uh, 12 years old before I realized that everybody didn't have raviolis for Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, because they made their own, um, and, um, and a lot of the, probably the majority of people that we associated with were either family or other Italian families. Um, th they did have other friends that were that were um, other nationalities. Mm -hmm. um, but um, my grandmother, my dad's mother lived on the west side over on A Street. Um, so uh, there were 
lots of mixed cultures there on the west side at the time there and and Italians were a lot like uh, a lot of other cultures where you weren't back in like 1920 when they got here you weren't allowed to just live anywhere because of race and, and discrimination and stuff um, you were relegated to a certain part of town so the so the west side had a lot of Italians Mexican people uh, blacks uh, Germans too were there um, and um, Japanese um, Chinese um, and then Armenians had a different part of town but but it was pretty much segregated you know you were, you were pretty segregated and um, right in the little area where my grand where my dad grew up at um, was a lot of Italian Italians and, and Mexicans more than more than anything so, so um, again back to your childhood were there any early signs uh, about later sexual orientation well like I said I was always pretty sensitive but um, my dad, early on, bought a movie camera, and yeah, he was always taking movies. And I had this movie. In fact, I, I have a copy of it um, of me. I was um, maybe three years old, and I had a dish towel wrapped around me and a, a doily cloth, a round doily cloth mm -hmm. on my head um, and a purse and high heels and I was walking around. They used to think it was just the cutest thing and love to show people that and after I came out I think they were like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I suppose there was early signs like that. I mean I, you know, I, I remember always being attracted towards men. Mm -hmm. um, it just was a natural attraction for me. Um, I played in some intramural sports in school, but um, I didn't like doing a lot of boy things necessarily um, and um, I don't know I'm just like the little the, the, the sensitive kid you know? so how was that uh, how did that interact with your culture how did your I know they liked it when you were a toddler was there ever any change in the response to my that? dad just get frustrated with me that I that I wasn't you know I didn't want to play catch and football and you know those kind I mean I would do it but it wasn't uh, my thing. I um, I played more with girls than I did boys, as far as my friends went. I had closer relationships with girls than uh, than than old boys. I mean, I had boy, you know, some boys that were friends, but. Um, but yeah, I guess you know it's it's not something that's learned. It's something that just is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so so I guess you know that's probably where it was at. I I guess maybe my first sexual experience was um, there's a park over here on First and Clinton called Radio Park. And I was about 14. Somehow I'd gotten my hands on a little, little bottle of wine. And uh, so I was on my bicycle and I took the bottle of wine and I went over to Radio Park and um, was drinking my wine. And some man came up to me and uh, we ended up 
playing uh, in the bushes there. Um, and I thought it was just great, so I'd go out there all the time. And, uh, you know, uh, I thought, oh, wow, there's a queer in Fresno. One queer, just one, <laughs> just one. <yeah. laughs> um, and I remember, like, kids in high school would go out there and uh, chase gay people. Um, and uh, I remember actually participating when I'd get caught out there and say, oh, well, yeah, I was out here to, to chase queers too. Uh, and, um, you know, but I was chased. And I remember one time I actually got a gun pulled on me. Um, and I had to talk my way out of that too. But, um, you know, I... I guess I always tried to have a girlfriend, mm -hmm. and I was never comfortable with it, but um, that's the way it was supposed to be. And um, and I used to think to myself, well, I'm going through a phase. I'm going through a phase, mm -hmm. and I'm not really like that. And, um, and even through college, uh, I was still going through a phase, and I, I had moved down to um, Southern California. I was, uh, I was in my early twenties, and I had uh, gotten a job with Straw Hat Pizza as a uh, manager, and they transferred me down to L.A. and I had a girlfriend in Fresno, and. I started seeing this guy in L.A. And I finally got so frustrated with myself. It was a job I should have probably stayed at. I was very good at it. Um, and uh, I decided, no, I was going to come back to Fresno and get married and have kids and, and do, do the thing that you're supposed to do. And uh, I remember when I gave notice over there, they were like, what, what are you doing? Why are you quitting? You're, you're headed to corporate. Uh, you're, you know, you're, you're one of our top managers. Um, and I said, no, I've got to go. I have to go back to Fresno. And, um, I did. And I, my dad was a plumbing contractor. So, so I worked there. Uh, I was never very... Um, like I said, I didn't do a lot of boy things, and I, I wasn't very mechanically inclined, and I hated working out in the field with the tools, so I ended up working in the office as like a bookkeeper, and I'd, uh, I'd buy materials and uh, kind of run that side of the operation. Um, I came back to Fresno, say it was the end of... 1976 at that time and um, then I hadn't been back very long and I came down with hepatitis B um, and was off work for a while and I had when I first came back I had some friends that were working for an employment agency so I went to work in the employ at the employment agency and I had gotten a job order and of course I'd been a restaurant manager I got a job order um, for a wine company that was looking for a wine salesperson well then I came down with the hepatitis and I was um, not I wasn't able to work for several months and when I when I got better, I didn't want to go back to the employment agency, so I remembered that job order, so I followed up on it myself, and I got hired as a um, salesperson for Kribari Vineyards, and they were doing a new a new venture, um, and so I started selling wine and learning about it at the same time. Um, 
I ended up, my territory ended up uh, Bakersfield to Stockton. I was living in Fresno. Uh, and then at, at a certain point, we hired another salesperson who did Bakersfield North to Fresno. And then I did Stockton South to Fresno. Um, and then finally, finally, I was dating a girl here. By that time, I was oh, 27. Something. I was dating a girl here, and everybody assumed we were going to get married. Uh, I, in fact, I had gone back east with her, back to Minnesota to uh, visit her parents. Um, And in the meantime, I had, I guess, just when I came back from Fresno, I found this little bar called The Palace on Belmont. And I became friends with a the bartender there. My name was Jim. That's all, just Jim. <laughs> My middle name is James. Um, and... This bartender, he, said, he, he knew I was pretty closeted and, and just kind of coming out. Um, I, uh, my experiences had all been like haphazard, like um, parks and um, uh, when I was in L.A. I had gone to um, gone to a couple couple of bars but I, I still wasn't really out in the gay community um, and then the Red Lantern opened and I started going to the Red Lantern where I met Virgil and the whole crowd over there they only had beer and wine at the time but the palace down the street had had uh, liquor and I would go out with my girlfriend I would drop her off, and then I'd go to the Red Lantern, and and hopefully meet someone and take them home. Um, uh, still, my name was Jim, um, and I. Somehow, and I don't remember exactly when there was. There was a bar called The Hangout um, off of Herndon, just north of Herndon, uh, and Golden State, Old 99. I went in there one night, and uh, there was one customer in the bar, and I had gone to the bath. I came out, I went, there was no customers in the bar. I was the only one in there. I went to the bathroom. When I came out, there was one customer sitting there. I turned around, it was my younger brother, Frank. And we looked at each other, and I just... I just bolted and took off out of there and uh, tried to like not think about it. Um, so at this point were you still, uh, this next portion is exploring coming out, so were you still not out to yourself at this point? Were you still? I was starting to come out to myself. I was thinking maybe this isn't a phase, you know, um, but um, I was also, I had also gone through that part too that, that if anybody ever found out, I would just kill myself. Because, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't the way it was supposed to be. In the Italian community and in the general community? Yeah, just being from Fresno and, um, you know, it wasn't something that was talked about, you know. And I didn't know people. So it was a huge deal that you ran into your brother. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so anyway, I um, I guess I kept I kept doing this and I kept going out and then and going to the Red Lantern and I was really enjoying going out there. I had um, the place I, I 
I had bought this place along with a friend, and the friend got married, and I rented it out to a gay guy, and he took me up to San Francisco one night, and it was amazing. The, the uh, we just went to like one bar, and I think. Well, prior to that, I had been to San Francisco one time, um, and I had gone to a bathhouse, and it was like all old men, and this man came up to me, he says, what are you doing in here, because I was in my early 20s, maybe 22 or something, to, to backtrack, and he, and he said, uh, and he, he, point, he said, he said, you don't belong in this bar, there's, there, there's in this bathhouse, he said, he sent me south of market. I went south of market, walked into a club there, and all these guys were leather. And I had no idea what it was, but I got kind of paranoid. Mm -hmm. And I left there, and I ended up in this bathhouse, and I ended up just, I don't know what people had given me, but uh, I ended up high that night in that bathhouse all night long. It was like, wow, this is a whole new adventure. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. wow. Blew me away. But, um, and the same thing had happened in L.A. one time. I had gone into a bar, and there was all these cops in the bar, and I was like, oh, I must be in the wrong bar. And I didn't know anything about uniforms or anything at the time. I, just, I mean, I was pretty naive about about everything. And like I said, it wasn't talked about so much. Um, there wasn't too much that was really talked about. And then in early... In early 1977, not long after I had moved back from L.A., <coughs> my brother Frank moved to San Francisco. And uh, I was the oldest, Frank was second, and then Bob and Ron are the two youngest. And uh, so anyway, Frank moved to San Francisco, and I had... I had, I guess I was already going to the Red Lantern, and I had just decided, you know what, I am gay. And so, I remember it was a Friday, and I was getting off work, and I called Frank, and I said, uh, I'm going to fly up there tonight and see you for the weekend. And he was like, oh, well, I've got some plans. So I, and I said, don't cancel your plans, I can just come up, you know, so... Mm -hmm. At the time, a uh, round-trip plane ticket from Fresno to San Francisco was $32. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really cheap. And I went up, and this had to be early 1978, uh, when the stuff with Harvey Milk and all that was going on there. And Frank evidently, well, he did have a date. Um, but, uh, you know, he said, well, he's going to dinner with a friend and he might not be home that night. So he gave me keys to his place and I said, well, just point me in the direction of a good bar. And he said, straight or gay? And I said, well, maybe gay. Uh, so he sent me to this one bar in his neighborhood. He was living in the hate. And then he told me how to take the bus down to the Castro. And this is a Saturday, is it a Friday night? It was a Friday night. Uh, I got off the bus at 18th at Castro at like, I don't know, 8, 9 o'clock at night there. And all of a sudden, it was just full of gay people. And I was like, wow, I never knew this existed. And it was like a kid in a candy store. I just was like, just amazed. I was went from one bar to another bar. And, and, uh, I, um, I ended up at some guy's house that night for a while and for a few hours and then I went back to Frank's and that's kind of when I decided that yeah I am gay and I came back to Fresno and I continued to work and I was still seeing this girl and then I I, then I broke up with her. I broke up with her, and uh, I didn't really give her a reason why. I just said, I, I just can't see you anymore. I just can't see you anymore. And, I, and it wasn't fair to her. 
uh, sure, but I just I just couldn't talk to her like that. I'd had a girlfriend prior to that who I was really we were really good friends, really good friends. And after I came back to Fresno, we both started dating other people, and I called her and. Um, she had broken up with the guy she'd been dating, and I had broken up with the girl I had been dating. And so I asked her out to brunch, and before we went to brunch, I told her I was gay. And she looked at me and she laughed. She said, "You?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "Wow." She says, "That explains so much." <laughs> and um, we laughed. We um, went to brunch, and then we took a bunch of wine and went up in the hills and we got stoned and and we had just a great day. We just had a great day and a lot of fun and and just it was really it was really a great experience because we, we really cared about each other a whole lot and um, it just solidified our friendship and um, we both knew why why things happened like they like they had. Um, Is this the first person in the straight community that you had come out to, definitively? Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah. And then with um, your brother, had you both already come out to each other after me? After, after I'd gone to San Francisco, yeah. After I'd gone to San Francisco, we did. Okay. Yeah. So I was wondering when he said gay or straight, far, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I I assumed that, that that he was at that point that he was gay, uh. you know, living in San Francisco. But putting two and two together, and, um, so um, anyway, right about that time, then the the company wanted me to move to Modesto and uh, work that market, that Modesto Stockton market a little more intensely. So I did. I uh, went to Modesto. I bought a house, a little house up there and um, started frequenting the bars a lot and making some gay friends uh, up there. Um, and being a little more open because because I wasn't in Fresno, I had met uh, one guy who we became boyfriends right away. He was from Ohio, and Frank was already living in San Francisco, so we would go to San Francisco like every weekend. We'd be in San Francisco and partying and. And then this one weekend, we'd gone up, and we both met someone on it was like a Friday night. I guess we'd gone Friday after work, went to the bars. We both met someone, and we decided to meet back in that same bar on Sunday to go home. And on the way home, we were like, wow, I guess, you know, I guess we're not boyfriends. What are we? And we had a lot of tears and we had a lot of, you know, lovers come and lovers go, but friends are forever, type thing. And, um, and then it was shortly after that that my company closed and I was in Modesto with this house and my friend from Ohio, we both we were initially going to move to San Diego. And he had gone back to Ohio, and I was trying to sell my house. And anyway, I sold the house, and uh, a guy that I had met in San Francisco called me and said, Oh, you know what? There's a wine job up here in the Bay Area. Why don't you think about moving here instead of San Diego? So I went up there and I rented an apartment and my friend that I met in Modesto was going to be coming back from Ohio. So I got a two bedroom 
for us, and it was Christmas time, um, 1979, and my brother Frank was would take the Greyhound from San Francisco to Modesto, and then ride with me home to Fresno for Christmas. So on the way to Fresno, he told me that he was going to tell mom and dad the day after Christmas that he was gay. And I was like, oh, don't do that. Uh -huh. Don't do that. You're going to kill them. Oh, no, don't do that. Well, he did. And there was, I remember my mother crying, and there wasn't really anything said, but there was like lots of tension going on the next few days. Mm -hmm. um, we went back to Modesto. He went on to San Francisco, and I was, my house was closing like January 2nd or something, so I had to pack up and get ready to move to the, up to San Francisco, to the Bay Area. And it was New Year's Eve morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was packing stuff up in the house, packing the house up. There's a knock on the door, I opened the door, and there's my dad standing there. Mm -hmm. My little five foot four Italian plumbing contractor, dad from Fresno. And he says, he came in, and he said, well, can I come in? I said, yeah, come on in. And he paced, paced, pacing all around. He says, well, are you? I said, am I what? He says, are you like your brother? I said, do you mean am I gay? And he says, yeah. And I said, yeah. He said, okay. He says, he said, you know, your mother and I don't understand this. He said, but um, I want you and your brother to know that we love you both. If you don't see us for a while, it's not because we don't love you. It's because it's going to take us a while to understand this whole thing. Oh. He says, you're not going to start wearing dresses, are you? I said, no. <laughs> um, but um, so he left I moved to San Francisco my friend came back from Ohio and came in there and I had been in San Francisco I don't know maybe a month and my folks called and said hey we're coming up I was like okay hmm. Time, my brother Frank was working at a place called Hot and Hunky. It was a little hamburger joint on uh, 18th, just off of Castro. So I think I was working at a restaurant then, so I was working nights. And um, we were supposed to supposed to meet Frank for dinner. My folks got there. And I said, what do you want to do for lunch? And they both said, let's go have lunch where Frank works at. <laughs> I said, no, we don't want to go there for lunch. Oh, no, that's where we want to go for lunch. No, let's, don't go there for lunch. No, that's where we want to go for lunch. Well, my mother's blind, so she can't see. She's gone blind, maybe, you know, between her 40s and 50s. And... But my dad could see fine. <laughs> we went over to Hot and Hunky, and at the time they were having this Mr. Castro contest, and there's this guy, a poster of a guy in a hard hat with a dozen red roses there as we walk in. And, oh, God, Dad just saw that. Okay. <laughs> and, um, we go up to order, and Frank had his back to us, and they had these t shirts on. The back of the t shirt said, You can't beat our meat. And I go, okay, Dad saw that. Excuse me. Oh, I can call him back. Um, from where Frank turned around and his face turned just beet red. He was like, I You tried. Yeah, you know. So, so we ate lunch and not knowing nothing was really said. But... Um, my folks became very accepting, very accepting, and um, you know, in in San Francisco, 
you um, you had a lot of people that weren't from California or their families had disowned them and uh, so we were always bringing friends home with us gay friends and they were always welcome at my parents house um, and uh, you know the and my folks came to San Francisco, you know, fairly regularly, and uh, and they got to know our gay friends, and um, and San Francisco was an eye-opening experience. Uh, you know, I, I was introduced to lot of different people and being gay in San Francisco was just normal it wasn't there was just no hiding um, and, you know I'll back up a little bit and stuff before I before I moved before I moved to Modesto I remember I told my best friend here that I was gay he yelled and screamed at me and said, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. And, um... This before you told your ex-girlfriend? No, I think I'd already told her. Okay. But, um, anyway, um, so we kind of had a falling out there for a while. And, uh, I had been best man at his wedding, and, and I had told a couple other friends, um, and it was um, so it was getting around to my friends that I was gay um, and I moved to Modesto and uh, some friends had gotten married and were having a reception here in Fresno and I came down for the reception and there was one guy who was who we'd been friends since we were six years old and um I hadn't told him, although I figured he knew, he had heard. So I, I cornered him and I said, come here, I need to talk to you. And he, he resisted talking to me because he knew what I wanted to talk about and stuff. He ended up going outside with me and I said, I just want you to know I'm gay. He said, I know, I know, he said, just don't give up women. I said, fine, whatever you want to believe. You know, and and that was that. But it was it was kind of what I thought was going to happen really didn't happen. You know, um, my friends still accepted me. My family accepted me, and I was really lucky because um, there were so many so many gay people that we knew that their families disowned them at the time. Um, I mean, it still happens today. I don't know that it happens on the scale that it happened back then. I mean, being gay um, was thought to be a choice as, a, as opposed to just who you were. And uh, nobody understood it. Um, and... Being in San Francisco initially was was great. It was fun. And then I remember there was a newscast that came on. And I guess there had been an article in the paper that day. But the newscast came on and there had been... Uh, this was after the assassination of Harvey, Harvey Milk and all of that. And, uh... The newscast came on and said that there was this several that there had been some gay men that had died in San Francisco, New York, and L.A. and of a strange disease and didn't know what it was, but that it was spreading in the gay community and that they expected a huge number of gay men to die from this disease. And we were like, that can't be right. Um,
And so they didn't know, you know, what was going on with this. Um, at the time, they were calling it GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. Wow. And um, I was... I was working as uh, I was a wine buyer at the largest liquor store um, in San Francisco, and I had you know, lots and lots of customers. I was on the floor all the time, and I had to, I woke up one night and I couldn't breathe. in 1981. This was shortly right about the time that article had come out. It was actually June because it was before Pride Parade in San Francisco. Um, anyway, my roommate took me to the hospital and I was put admitted to the hospital with acute epiglutitis. My epiglottis was abscessed and swollen. And in the hospital a few days on antibiotics and then I left to get some medical advice because it was pride and I wanted to go to the pride parade mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and that was okay for a while and and then uh, my tonsils abscessed and so I had my tonsils out and then and then I had a lymph node on my neck and they wanted to biopsy it so I, I went in for a biopsy and I went back t to work the next day and I had a little patch on my neck where they had taken the lymph node out. And one of my good customers at the liquor store was a doctor from UCSF and he said what happened? And I said oh I, said, I had, a, had a lymph node that was taken out and he said really? He said, I want you to call this uh, doctor over at UC. And I said, why? He said, well, he says, there's a study going on. I just want you to call him. Okay, so I called him and went in. There was this group. It was gay men with swollen lymph nodes that were, that were in this group. And they were trying to figure out what was going on. They were assuming that... Um, that people were infected with this grid, this gay related immune deficiency syndrome. The grid. And the, um, so they had all kinds of research going on, and they, uh, they would bring us in, and they'd pull a lot of blood, and they'd save the blood, and they would, um, do tests. And they had public health nurses that came out to the house to interview you, and um, they were trying to find out where this disease was coming from, how people were being infected. Um, and then the study ended, and I guess it was about that time people started getting sick people dying um, there was a lot of stuff that, there was one thing called toxoplasmosis which affected the brain and uh, it was like an instant Alzheimer's almost um, <clears throat> and I remember friends becoming infected with that and, uh, and then becoming very childlike uh, like quickly and people uh, they'd be fine and all of a sudden they'd come down with this nemesis this pneumonia and they'd be dead in a few days and you know we there was a lot of candlelight marches and um, they were trying to close all the bathhouses in San Francisco at the time um, to stop the spread of this thing uh, there were no treatment, no medications. Um, uh, people would go in the hospital and the nurses and doctors 
would uh, be basically all these sterile things, the gloves and masks and things on the head. Because nobody knew how, if it was airborne or, or how it was transmitted. Um, but I mean, I just went off my daily life and I kept selling wine and kept going out. And, you know, they were trying to, they were pushing condoms at the time, which before that, prior to that, there was, even with the high number of hepatitis B gay men with hepatitis B and uh, with um, other sexually transmitted diseases, there was never any precautions or education or, or anything about how to prevent any of this stuff because it was thought that you could just go get an antibiotic. You, could, you know, hepatitis, just get over it. And if you got a gonorrhea or something, you just go get an antibiotic and, you know, and be fine. And so there was no need for protection or or anything else. Um, you know, I kept dating, I kept seeing people. Um, once in a while, you'd use a condom, but most of the time, you still, condoms were not the norm. Um, You know, I was pretty comfortable being a gay man in San Francisco and uh, with gay friends. Um, work, you really didn't have to worry about being gay. Um, I remember when I was working at the liquor store, I had all these straight young college guys who worked in our warehouse. And... Um, they had become friends of mine, you know, and, and then and, uh, I would teach them about wine, and um, I went back there, went back, walked back into the warehouse one day, and they were talking about queers, and I said, hey, watch it, and they all knew I was gay. One kid popped up, he says, well, you're not a, you're not a regular queer, and I said, well, really? I said, tell me what a regular queer is. What is a regular queer? Well, you know, I said, no, I don't know. And the conversation just kind of ended. It was like, okay, you're not a regular queer. How does that, you know, transpire? Because I wasn't obvious. You're straight passing. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, but I was just me. I was just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be anybody that I wasn't. But um, so, so that was always interesting. Um, I had um, some good friends, good lesbian friends from Stockton, and uh, they uh, they had wanted to come with some of their girlfriends to go to the Pride Parade and sleep on my floor. That's fine. But at the same time, my youngest brother, who's straight, decided he wanted to come to San Francisco that same weekend. And I was like, oh, Ron, I don't know if this is a good weekend. Oh, no, I'm just going to come. I'm going to come. Well, he ends up with all the lesbians. He went to Pride with them and ended up at some um, lesbian bar where I guess they ripped off his shirt and stuff, and he was just having a great time. I come home. I'm three sheets to the wind after partying all day long, and I go to go go to bed, and my mattress is gone. The only thing there is a box spring, and I find my mattress in the kitchen with my brother and two girls. I'm like, well, he thought he died and went to heaven. Uh, um, and so, so he would, you know, he would come to San Francisco all the time, and he, you know, he, he wanted to reenact this and. <clears throat> You know, one time he came and he says, can we please go to a straight bar? I'll always go to gay bars, you know. Okay, fine. So I took him out to some straight bars. And he met some girl and she had a girlfriend. And he says, oh, go talk to her. And I said, oh, I'll talk to her. And I'm okay, fine. You know, so I talked to her. And the gal, it's just funny anecdotes of things that would happen. But this was like on the... Um, 
Clement Street, San Francisco, which is where all the comedy rose, where Robin Williams and all these people would um, would go. And so I, I said to the, my brother and this girl would go dance, and I said to this her girlfriend, I said, "Would you like to dance?" And she was like, "Got real smug with me and stuff." And I said, "Look it." I said, "I'm gay. I could care less." Huh? I just thought maybe you might want to dance. Well, all of a sudden she turns around. And she says, "Oh, well, you just haven't had a good woman, and I've got a place in Sausalito, and come on up there, and I'll show you what a good woman can teach you and stuff." And I said, "No, I'm not interested." But just funny anecdotes, just just things that that would happen. I mean, we would do after Pride in San Francisco. I had uh, gotten involved involved with some friends who had a cabinet shop and we opened a gallery in San Francisco so we'd have these big parties. Um, we had the very, very first AIDS fundraiser in San Francisco at our at our gallery called uh, the Military Ball. And um, we raised some money for HIV AIDS and uh, uh, after Pride we'd have these huge parties there and there was always big parties going on and always something going on and people at that time, even though people were starting to die, people were still ignoring the disease. And I think I think about by that time they had identified the HIV virus and they started calling it AIDS. What about what year was it? Had to be about eighty four. 84, I guess, 84, 85, something like that. Um, and, um... So within the gay community, people just continued as before and... Yeah, for, for the most part, people were, people were in a lot of denial mm -hmm. about the whole thing. Um, gay men were no longer allowed to donate blood. That's one thing that happened. And um, lesbians became big blood donors. Um, I remember my brother Frank had a good friend who had, at one time had been one of his roommates who was really sick with AIDS. And he was from somewhere in the Midwest and the guy, the guy got, you know, was real sick and he had, um, he had called the guy's parents and uh, mother said, well, we can't come out, we have a, something going on at the country club. And, um, There were just there were lots of people who got sick, who died, whose family wanted nothing to do with them, um, uh, and by eighty eight, by nineteen eighty eight, um, there was um, people were kind of getting out of their denial. I'm not sure if AZT had been approved yet or not, um, but <clears throat> um, I think AZT had been approved. But ACT UP was going very strong. Um, there was a lot of candlelight vigils, a lot of marches. Uh, Reagan still hadn't said the word AIDS. Um, so the marches to raise awareness to try to get a reaction. Yeah, I was trying to get money. I was trying to get resources. I was trying to get the, trying to get the fast track on drugs that were being developed. Um, I was trying to get some recognition by the president and by Congress. Um, it was just felt that because. At, at that time also 
AIDS had started to affect the hemophiliac community. Well, because of the donated. Yeah, because because uh, because hemophiliacs, the blood does not clot, so they had this thing called factor eight, which they could, which was made up of lots of different people's blood, and they could use factor eight to inject, and it would. Help, it would help the blood clot. <clears throat> and um, the blood supply was not secure, it was not um, being tested. And so a lot of hemophiliacs became infected. Um, then the other, the other group was the injection drug users who uh, also became infected. So it spread beyond the gay community. As far as we knew, it wasn't in the general population yet. Uh, and then, this was, my brother had moved back to Fresno with his partner. He actually was living in this house. Um, and in 88, my company wanted to open the market down here. And since I had started working in the wine business here, they knew I knew the area and asked me if I would consider coming down here to open the market. So I did, I came back to Fresno. I thought, well, I'll be here a year or two. And I'm still here uh, 30 years later. But um, That was, I'm trying to think, that was, yeah, late 80s. There had been, I had lost a few friends uh, and a lot of acquaintances. Um, People were starting to move out of San Francisco, you know, trying to, I guess, get away from AIDS. Um, company asked me if I'd come to Fresno and open the market, and I was like, okay. So, so I did. I came came back down here and opened the market and uh, started going back out to the to the Red Lantern. Um, and started getting involved. I mean, with gay people, just whatever. I remember, um, and I was in a denial about being in the that clinical, that uh, study group that I was in early on. And then, um, About that time, my brother Frank told us that uh, he'd been diagnosed with AIDS. And then it was a few months later, just later in the summer, and he seemed okay. He seemed fine. And he was taking his AZT. Which uh, I think at the time people would take about 12 pills a day, which was causing a lot of toxicity. Um, August 89. August of 89. Uh, a friend of mine from San Francisco had moved down here and was living with me. He said, "Why don't you get the HIV test?" He says, "He says I got it." He says, "I know I'm and I know I'm positive." He says, "You ought to get it because now there's that medicine, that AZT." I, said, ah, I don't know if I want to know or not. I'm okay. And he said, "Just get the test." So anyway, I started having some problems, and I went into the doctor, 
and they started running some tests. Um, I was having some problems in my backside there, and um, they wanted to do a biopsy. And so at the same time, I asked to have a HIV test done. And I got a phone call. It was the day before my birthday, 1989. Um, that I had an appointment with an oncologist at Kaiser here in Fresno and the surgeon had called me herself and said you need to make this appointment you need to get to that appointment she said I've called you several times you've been ignoring my messages you be there said, okay so I went there and the oncologist told me that I was HIV positive and that I had anal rectal cancer. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. Um, and initially I told people about the cancer, but I didn't tell them about the HIV. I told a couple people, I told my brother. And then I, this was a Thursday on Friday, I was being measured for radiation treatments and on the following Monday, I was admitted to a community hospital before Kaiser had their hospital and I uh, started my chemo treatments and that's when they gave chemo in the hospital. Um, and they had done a little surgery to remove what they could remove and they did the radiation and the, and the chemo uh, and then I and then I started on the AZT and by the time I started on the AZT they were, you were only taking three pills a day as opposed to the 12 <clears throat> so it wasn't as toxic but it wasn't really doing anything for people either and then uh, sp spring of 1990 Frank got sick. Um, and Frank had gotten real active. He, um, he got gotten very active with um, HIV AIDS. And I remember he asked me if I could get a case of champagne that donated uh, for an AIDS fundraiser. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just kind of blew it off. And anyway, he got sick. It's been about April, uh, at, later in April, maybe like May, it was in May, May. and uh, he had been working on this book, It's Nice to Know, and it was the very, very first uh, resource manual for people with HIV AIDS here in the Fresno area, and he was doing it in collaboration with 2D Bar from St. Agnes, uh, from the AIDS programs at St. Agnes, um, and it was a resource directory for people with HIV AIDS about all kinds of different things. You can take this. But um, at any rate, Frank's Frank was in St. Agnes for about six weeks and then he passed away on uh, June 13th, 1990. Um, my folks were at the hospital every day, all day long. And one of my aunts was there, a lot, a lot too. And stuff. And, uh, you know, we couldn't convince my dad that that when he was working with Frank, he had to put gloves on. He just wouldn't hear of it uh, and stuff. And uh, and then nighttime, uh, my two brothers and myself would take turns going and spending the night at the hospital because Frank would get delirious and uh, they were having to tie him down and we didn't want him tied down so we would go spend the night in the hospital and we this went on for like I said six weeks um, and uh, then, he, then he died on I don't know June 13th that morning I woke up like four o'clock in the morning and I thought 
we were planning to bring Frank home the next day back here in this house and with hospice um, because he had doing, been doing better but we knew he was terminal and um, I don't know it's like 4 o'clock in the morning I woke up and I thought I have to get down to the hospital I got down there and we had hired someone to, to sit with him that night and uh, and he he's, his lungs were starting to rattle and stuff and everything and I talked to the doctor and they said well he's he's dying so I called my folks they came down and throughout the day I mean all my aunts and uncles were there and everybody my grandmother was there everybody was there at the hospital and all you know very supportive and stuff but um, he died that day and It was, uh, he, he got to see the rough draft of this book, but he never, never saw it published. Um, when Frank died, uh, you know, we were raised Catholic. It belonged to Sacred Heart Parish over here on Clinton, on uh, Cedar, Stoffer Clinton, which my folks had walked, you know, gone and collected money to build the church there and stuff. And, so we planned a memorial at Sacred Heart, and the priest at Sacred Heart said, you know, I really don't want those kind of people in my church. Well, my father became outraged. We all became outraged. Um, my parents' next door neighbor Wayne Kennedy. And Wayne was uh, um, Wayne was the kind of person who didn't want the Japanese people moving it across the street when they bought the house across the street. And, you know, he was pretty um, had a lot of prejudices, but he kept getting slapped in his life. And I had to overcome his prejudices, but I remember Wayne made him. While, while Frank was in the hospital, um, I don't know if you ever heard of Beef Character. Beef Character had um, Northwest, it's called Northwest Baptist Church, I think it's called Northwest now. And um, it was a kind of evangelical church, but he had a son, Randy, and Randy was married to. A woman, Cynthia character who has an organization, an AIDS organization called All About Care here in Fresno. <clears throat> anyway, um, somehow his son, Rand, Bruce, Bruce's son Randy, died of AIDS. And um, he had somehow heard about my brother Frank up there at St. Agnes and came up to St. Agnes to see them and him and my father got into a I guess a really nice discussion uh, about uh, AIDS and sons having AIDS and, and stuff and Buford said you know if there's anything I can do you know let me know well when the church said the priest said he didn't want those kind of people in his church my father called Beef Character, and we moved my brother's memorial service to Northwest Baptist and had a priest there. <laughs> and Wayne Kennedy, the guy next door, who was very big in it, made a big sign. He stuck right in front of the main doors going to the Sacred Heart Church saying this memorial service for Frank Mastro has been moved to Northwest Baptist Church and um, word got out about the priest and they had a lot of fallback from uh, church members about what this priest had said and about what they had done to this family and uh, uh, that's kind
kind of with the Fresno Bee picked up the story and, wow. and um, um, can we shut the tape off for a minute? Sure. That Fresno B kind of picked it up. Um, my uh, they actually printed in the Fresno B that the service was going to be at Sacred Heart. And my dad's cousin was circulation manager at the Fresno Bee at the time. And he called him up because they didn't rewrite obituaries. And they went ahead and made an exception and rewrote his obituary with the correct location of it. And that's kind of, I guess, how the Fresno Bee kind of got involved. Um, <clears throat> but um, we moved the service. And uh, and it was like the, and the place was uh, was packed, it was just packed. And I remember, you know, old Italian ladies showing up, you know, in the wheelchairs and stuff too. You know, just uh, just all kinds of people showed up, and the, the support was like really overwhelming. Um, and you know my dad my dad was an interesting character you know he was just well both my parents my dad and my mom they're just so supportive of us um and I remember my dad used to go to mcdonald's every morning for coffee and and his buddies would all go over there and all of a sudden, he wasn't going to McDonald's anymore. <clears throat> and I said, uh, Pop, how come you uh, don't go to McDonald's anymore? You should go to Manchester now. He says, yeah. He says, those son of a bitches. He says, they all know Frank died of AIDS. He says, and all they want to talk about is the gays. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, um, it was like, you know, just always, just always there and always, you know, always uh, supportive. Always supportive. Very fortunate. Very, very fortunate as opposed to so many others that weren't. Um, so when Frank became ill, is that the first that your parents heard of, heard of this illness? Or no, no, they, 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 no they, they, they knew of it. Were they worried about you too? Yeah, I guess, yeah, but, you know, we were, f we seemed fine, you know, I mean, you know, and then, of course, I had to tell them that about my HIV status, and, and what I, what I did after I found out that I was HIV positive, just to back up a little bit, it was, um, I called the doctor from the study group in San Francisco, and I told him I had tested positive here in Fresno, and he said, well, he said, you were positive back in 1981. He said, didn't tell you. They did, well, they didn't have a test then, uh, but they had saved our blood. I see. They tested the blood later, after the... And uh, he said, everybody in that group was positive at that time. And as far as I know, I'm the only one from that group that's still alive. Wow. But, um... How many were in that group? Maybe a hundred. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just remember it was a large, large room and there was it was packed with it was all gay men. But um, and then this doctor took over as became the, the lead AIDS doctor at um, San Francisco General Hospital. Don Abrams. And um, anyway, so Frank passed away, his partner, and that was a real nightmare. It was, you know, Frank had given Adam, his partner, um, a power of attorney, but hadn't named 
and the alternates. And Adam was sick himself and had terrible dementia. So here we were, Frank really sick in the hospital. His partner who has dementia really bad has is making all the medical decisions and we're freaking out. And his doctor would not talk to us. And finally, my father went to the administration and said, I just said, hey, I understand about this thing and want his partner and stuff, but the guy is not capable of making decisions. And, you know, and the doctor needs to talk to us because, you know, and, and we were taking care of Adam, too, at the time because, uh, you know, and, and but it was, and it was hard for Adam. Um, it's just, it, it, it was really, you know, you don't want to usurp the authority that, that a person has given their partner. And so by the same token, you want to make sure that they're getting what they, what they need. And um, anyway, Adam was living here in this house. When Frank died, the, I had a condo. And what we thought we'd do is I would move in here with Adam, take care of him. And, um, and then these women, um, friends of my brother's a lesbian couple from uh, Santa Cruz, they ended up moving Adam up to Santa Cruz with them. So then I moved into this house, um, but um, <clears throat> and um, after Frank died, I thought I needed to get involved somehow, and. Um, there had been this group of gay men that had been attending sport groups at Central Valley AIDS team. And I had gone through the AIDS volunteer training over there by that time. And, um, anyway, these guys decided that that they were tired of sitting around in a group every week and talking about how miserable their lives were, but they wanted to stay connected with other people that were HIV positive. <clears throat> and so they started this group called Open Heart. And every other Wednesday night, they'd meet in someone's home, and everybody would bring like a bottle of soda, potato chips, or some sort of snacks. And they'd play games, or watch movies, or just something for a a few hours, and um, I got invited to go. You had to, at that time, you had to be invited to go, and um, uh, and I got real active in it and started hosting groups. Um, somewhere I got lost along the way. Oh, okay. And then in November of 1990, and Frank had died in June. In November of 1990. I guess prior, just prior to that, after I got done with my cancer treatment, all this stuff, I had gone, yeah, I had gone to, I had gone over to state rehab because I couldn't, I couldn't be doing all the traveling I was doing because I was doing Stockton down here to Fresno and and I was gone too much, and I needed to be here more. It just it just after the cancer and stuff, I just thought I needed to uh, do something else. So I went to state rehab, and um, I had, 
and I asked to have some rehabilitation services to change careers. And they said, well, you're not a candidate for rehabilitation services. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, you're HIV positive, so you're only going to live a couple more years. And so you're not a candidate for rehabilitation services. And okay, so I, I filed for Social Security Disability, and then um, actually on, on November 1st of 1990, my doctor put me on state disability, and uh, then I filed for Social Security Disability, and I was denied. So I went back to the counselor at state rehab, and I said, remember what you told me about that I wasn't a candidate? And he said, yeah. I said, I said, well, I said, I need a letter from you stating that. So I stated that, I sent it back in with the Social Security reevaluation, and I was approved right away. <clears throat> um, but right about that time, no November of 1990, I was going to the open heart groups, and um, the executive director at Central Valley AIDS team invited me to go to this meeting of the HIV Care Consortium here in Fresno, and that's they were they were approving Congress had approved these Ryan White funds for care for people, and um, so I showed up at the meeting, kind of dressed like I'm dressed right now, a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. Every time I try to say something, nobody would pay any attention to me. I thought, oh, okay, this is bullshit. So I showed up to the next meeting in a coat and tie. And all of a sudden, I had credibility. Well, within a couple of months, I was elected chairman of the HIV Care Consortium and put on the regional board of the HIV Care Consortium. And... Um, then we started divvying out money to people, uh, needs assessments and, and different things. The open Heart Group was still going. Um, it kept growing and growing. Um, at that point, there was maybe three or four of us that were hosting because the group, you, you had, to be, it had to be in a house somewhere that had a yard that had, had a place big enough to accommodate everybody. Um, at one point, the group had gotten up to about a hundred guys, um, and we had a lot of activities here. I have a pool back here, so we were doing things more than just Wednesday nights. Um, we would do <coughs> an annual party here where we invite. Um, people from the agencies. Um, we had started, we would go out to the bars together. Um, they, um, And we were losing people in the group. Guys were dying. It seemed like it seemed like every week someone would die. Um, and and it was interesting. I had gotten together with my first long-term relationship in '92. Jimmy. Born Hubert Willi Dittmar in Germany, and uh, he was an orphan. And at four years old, his parents were stabbed as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and they adopted him and his brother in Germany and uh, moved to Florida. Um, anyway, we had gotten together, and then 
shortly after we were together, Jim had found out that he was HIV positive as well. He was going to school here in Fresno, that's how I met him. And uh, after school, he went back down to Long Beach. And when he got back down to Long Beach, he'd been gone for several months. He found a letter from the health department there, and he was HIV positive. Anyway, he ended up moving, moving here to Fresno. Um, open heart thing was still going on. I was still really active and everything. And um, in um, June 11th of 1994, Jim died. Right here in that room over there. Um, we had gone to Hawaii six months before he died. He loved it. He loved it. And, uh, wanted his ashes scattered in Hawaii. So my two brothers and myself flew over to Hawaii and we scattered his ashes. <coughs> um, <clears throat> There's a. Um, I never cried. I never. Um, people would die to become. Okay. They died. And um, the open heart group, we would kind of get together when someone died. Remember, one guy died, and him and his partner were. Uh, big Star Trek fans and we sat here on my patio and we, we made this Starship Enterprise wow. and filled it with flowers and everything and uh, took it to his funeral. Um, but there were always funerals going on. There was always somebody dying. Um, there's still a lot. There's a lot of discrimination out there. Um, we had had uh, one kid in the group, really sweet kid, and um, he passed away and went to his funeral service over at Stevens and Bean. Here it is. Dad and his brother were both Pentecostal ministers. And um, the service, they started talking about the fact that he was burning in hell. Wow. Um, um, a lot of people walked out. You know, um, there was. Thing, everything gets kind of jumbled up, but there's lots of events. There was, I had gone back to uh, Washington, D.C. in 92. Uh, the AIDS quilt was being displayed on the, on the mall at, uh, in D.C. And I had gone back, I was going to be working emotional support. Uh, Bill Clinton had just been elected president, and uh, George Bush was had three more weeks. Was it three more weeks? Something like that. Uh, maybe it was a little longer. Six more weeks, something like that. Anyway, um, Jeff Robinson and ACT UP Fresno was there protesting and uh, doing stuff. Um, I met a lot of people who were viewing the panels and, and there was a lot of tears, a lot of disbelief. Um, 
I came across this one woman just bawling, just bawling. And she was standing over the quilt of this woman named Kimberly Bergallis. Kimberly Bergallis made national news. Um, she was from Florida, and she was a young straight woman. And she'd gone to the dentist. And come to find out, this dentist was HIV positive, and he was injecting patients with his blood. And uh, people were becoming HIV positive. And I had a long talk with this woman, and she said she had been a friend of Kim's. And she said, the hardest part what for her was the fact of how angry Kim was until the day she died. Uh, I don't know, I could blame her for being that angry. It was, you know, it was, it, there was a big panic at the time, too, about going to the dentist until it actually came out that he was purposely infecting people with the virus. Um, was it more prejudice after finding out what he had done against yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I had gone for a massage one day. I don't know what it was. Something with my back. <clears throat> and I mentioned to the masseuse that, that I was HIV positive. And uh, he put gloves on to massage me. Um, Lots of, just lots of, um, people wouldn't say it, but you felt it. And um, I had even, after I came back from Fresno, before I even got the diagnosis in 88, um, uh, some straight friends of mine would, they'd get together every, every Monday, every other Monday, play poker. And I was asked to come play poker. And two of the guys refused to play poker anymore if I was going to play poker because I was gay and they didn't want to get that AIDS. Wow. And that was right after I had. So the other guys said, well, I guess you guys aren't playing poker then. That's great. So, um, but uh, I was just lucky. I was just lucky with my family and friends. Um, and the gay community um, was very, started to get a cohesiveness about it. The gay community, I think. AIDS, as I said, the worst of the best. One of the things that, that I see that happened with the gay community because of AIDS was the gay community matured. You got a maturity about it and got a purpose. Um, you know, before that, there was just... It was a lot of sex, a lot of drugs, a lot of party, party, party. And all of a sudden, AIDS slapped the gay community in the face, and people had to grow up. Um, like I said, I was in Washington, D.C., and ACT UP. Jeff Robinson and his group, ACT UP, from Fresno, was there. We did a March of the White House. There were a lot of ACT UP groups there, but right in front of the White House, standing right there in the middle, big sign, ACT UP Fresno. Awesome. Yeah, just, uh, you know, one of the more visible groups. And Jeff's done so much for the community over the years. But, um, you know, I got involved 
in uh, the buddy system, uh, mentoring, and just being friends with other guys that were HIV positive and helping them through the disease process. And um, there was a lot of confusion. There was um, there was a doctor here in Fresno who had been my brother's doctor, and he was really the only private practice doctor that was seeing AIDS patients at the time. And <clears throat> he he got ill himself and abruptly closed his practice. And at the time, I was chairman of the HIV Care Consortium. And all of a sudden, we had all these patients who couldn't get their medications. Uh, some were on hospice, um, and we couldn't find doctors to see these patients. So, so I called the California Medical Society, who said, "We will send doctors to Fresno," and. I guess they got a hold of the local Fresno Madera Medical Society. And as soon as they got wind of it, all of a sudden we had all kinds of doctors that came came forward then locally here and said they would they would accept AIDS patients. Wow. But most doctors wouldn't take an AIDS patient then. Um, was it was the change in their image uh, an incentive to Start the Fresno Madera Medical Society got terribly embarrassed that the state medical society said, <clears throat> called them up, reamed them, and said, We're sending doctors down there. You have a crisis there, and you guys aren't dealing with it. Um, I mean, I was lucky. I was Kaiser, so Kaiser always, you know, Kaiser's out of out of Oakland. They, you know, they um, they always they were always on top of it. Uh, there was a couple doctors at um, what was it, the VMC Valley Medical Center, before it was that, that treated patients, but and the VA treated AIDS patients, but. Um, as far as private practice goes, there was Dr. Reinch, and then uh, Dr. Borrow also had a few patients, but that was it. Um, so there really wasn't anything for people who had private insurance or uh, in the private sector. As far as doctors went here. Um, so when did the when did the Fresno Madera Medical Society come to Oh, that didn't happen until '96, but I'll tell you about that. Um, Central Valley AIDS team um, they went through a lot of trials and tribulations. Um, they um, There was a case manager there named Rocky. Um, really wonderful lady. Um, and uh, they used to have this group called Family and Friends, which I would take my mother to it. Um, and it was for people that, it was for family and friends of people who either had someone living with HIV AIDS or had lost someone to HIV AIDS. And it had become a pretty popular group. And Oh, for some reason, this one night, they weren't... Uh, they weren't going to be able to meet there. And Rocky had called me. And they had met up here at my house, in this room, actually, before. And... Um, she said, do you think we could use your house tonight? I said, ah, oh. I said, you know, I said, if you could find someplace else, I'd appreciate it. I said, I, 
really not up to it tonight. Just, but, you know, if you can't, then let me know. And <clears throat> then I didn't hear any more from her. And the news came on at 5 o'clock that night. And they had been talking about this guy in Milwaukee, Jeffrey Dahmer. And that he had uh, killed all these guys and dismembered them and had them in his freezer and stuff. And they said, and there's a local connection. His mother is from Fresno and is a case manager at Central Valley AIDS team. He was Rocky's son. Well, obviously, that group didn't happen that night. Uh, she was sequestered. She was put into, taken into hiding by friends. Um, uh, and the gay community really supported her. She was a wonderful woman, a wonderful case manager. She helped many gay people, um, many people with HIV AIDS. <clears throat> and so that was kind of a turning point. And I'll get back to Rocky later, but um, she worked for a while. Uh, there was an executive director named Catherine Calkins who had been there at Central Valley AIDS team. They were doing a lot of education prevention at the time. And um, clients would walk in, and uh, they had a big room there. They'd walk in, and you'd go in, and you'd have a cup of coffee, and and it'd help them make up safer sex kits with condoms and lube and the stuff that would be passed out. There was a group called the Condom Crusaders that would go out to the bars and weekends and pass these things out to people and do a little education. And uh, all of a sudden, they got a new executive director, and they locked that door. And basically, they locked us out of our agency. This is the way we looked at it. Because we could no longer go back into that room and have our cup of coffee or <clears throat> bring in donuts or whatever it was we did and, and stuff. So, so, you know, then, of course, our open heart group really grew. People were trying to really get the connection there. Um, about 95, we had lost a huge number of members from that open heart group. Just all kinds of people had just died, 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 died. And and then I I got sick and I was hospitalized and uh, I had wasting syndrome and I had gone from about 170 pounds to 120 pounds and what a matter of I don't know a month. Pretty emaciated. And they said, "Well, you're not going to live very long." And um, and I had to resign my chairmanship from the uh, HIV care consortium. I just I I couldn't do it anymore. And um, At any rate, it pretty much looked like Open Heart was going to was going to be gone. Uh, I was still traveling to the Office of AIDS working groups that I was working on, but um, I was uh, talking to a friend of mine who's a former Catholic nun from Chicago mm. and I was telling her about the group and, and you know that uh, 
one of my fears was that there's only just a handful of us left. Uh, that was kind of like the leadership, and that uh, once we were gone, that uh, the group was just no longer going to be in existence. And I really wish that there was a way to start something so that it could continue on. And she said, well, you know, I tithe. She says, I tithe $500 a month, but don't tithe it to a church. I could tithe $500 a month to you guys if you wanted to start something. And I said, really? So I talked to Rocky about it, and she was no longer at Central Valley AIDS team. But I thought, you know, this would be something that she could get involved with. Cause she was going through a lot of shit. Uh, her son, Jeff, had been murdered in prison. Um, and she was kind of, had kind of become a lost soul in a lot of ways. She, uh, she felt tremendous guilt over all these young men that her son had murdered. Uh, and so she said, you know, m maybe, I said, you know, I need to do it in connection with another organization, maybe like someone that's already a nonprofit. And she said, well, let's talk to Richard Stone at uh, Fresno Center for Nonviolence. And I said, really? You think they might be interested? And she said, yeah, they put on, they take on a lot of little projects. So went over and talked to Richard, and he was all excited about it, and talked to his board of directors, and they said, yeah, we'll take you guys on. So um, we took our little $500 a month, and we rented one little room, and then shared the other space with them, paid a little bit of rent, and we opened the living room as a 12-hour-a-week drop-in center. And, <clears throat> and we kept, and then the HIV Care Consortium um, started giving us a little monthly stipend. And then uh, there was a lot of people that were interested in the in the organization, and people started uh, donating monthly, um, pledging. We did a pledge drive, and uh, the living room just kind of took on a life of its own, and it went from a uh, 12 hour a week drop in center that they had a little house in the back that had a kitchen so we we read it that we started doing lunches on Tuesdays and Thursdays and then we got a little bit of well, we got a, a, I, I remember getting my first grant it's a five thousand dollar grant we got our first year our first year in existence um, the entire agency, our entire budget was eight thousand dollars, and um, we started to get a lot of people referred there by all the agencies. Uh, people just started donating stuff to us, and uh, uh, then we got a little bit of Ryan White funding. And uh, we became the lead agency for housing, for HIV housing for care. And then we finally incorporated as our own thing. And we moved over to Broadway, running a space over there. <clears throat> and then that's when I got the bright idea of well, let's open this up to other agencies and not even charge them, but let them come in here and offer services inside here. That's when the 
health department started having a, having a counselor come over regularly to do counseling on premises and uh, AIDS program St. Agnes would uh, would come over and meet clients there um, case manager from uh, UMC would come over and then uh, about that time the Central Valley AIDS team went bankrupt and just abruptly closed the doors. And that's when the health department came to me and said, are you ready? I said, are ready for what? And they said, are you ready to take on these grants? Education prevention, case management, all that stuff. So several of the employees from Central Valley AIDS team came over. Um, I went over, I needed to open a food pantry because <coughs> the food pantry was closed. And uh, United Way was going to transfer their grant to us. But I had to find space, so I went over about a block away. And there was a large building there and some space available. And um, talked met with the realtor. And he said, well, I have to tell you, the building's for sale. And I said, so what does that mean? He says, I can't give you a lease. He says, it's going to be a month to month. And we don't know how long it's going to be. This is a 15,000 square foot building <coughs> with a fenced parking lot. <clears throat> and I said, just out of curiosity, how much are they asking for the building? He said, 150,000. I said, really? Sold. I said, I want to put an offer in. I, even, I did that before we were talking to my board of directors. We ended up buying the building. Uh, and the food pantry went in there. We had some tenants in there that were paying rent that was actually like paying the mortgage. Uh, we had gotten a grant, grant from the California endowment for half a million dollars um, and uh, there was a church a little independent church husband and wife um, nice people and uh, they uh, part of our grant was uh, this is called Trent women in transition. This is women that were at high risk for developing HIV AIDS. Um, they would uh, they would come in for classes and things and this church, we had an agreement with the church where we would pay them to do child care for these women. Um, we had all kinds of things going on. The food pantry, oh, at the time we were we were we had about 250 people a week coming in for food I had uh, about three case managers three or four educators uh, we had a nurse practitioner that I had a contract with that would come in and uh, do different things with these women and also with our HIV patients. Um, we were involved in things like needle exchange. and um, I tried to open the place up to the community. Um, I had a thing. Um, with federal grants, you can't ask anybody to do anything. And... Um, I needed more volunteers, but uh, the other thing was uh, I wanted clients to be more involved and have a little more self-esteem. So uh, I started this thrift store. If they volunteered the agency, they could earn living room bucks that they could spend inside the thrift store. So um, all of a sudden I had all kinds of volunteers. I don't think that thrift store ever made us any money. but. Uh, but uh, got a lot of people involved. Uh, so 
guess that all started like in, in 96. And we grew from that $8,000 a year budget, uh, budget to, well, I said that $500,000 was over three years. I think we had about, I think at the time we had, we're operating on about a $300,000 a year budget from 8000 and I had 12 employees. Um, AIDS money started to started to fade away, and um, was it was there less stigma generally, and so did people there was assume less, there was less need? There was well, what had happened in 1996? As I said, I was I was dying. I, you know, I, I figured I'd open the living room and it's going to be up to other people to run it because I was going to be dead. Um, I also had great credit. So I went ahead and I took out credit life insurance on all my credit cards. And I'd go to Hawaii. I went to Hawaii. I helicopter rides, limousines, and had a great time. Um, and then I lived. <laughs> had to pay these credit cards back and finally had to declare bankruptcy. Um, that, but, April for, but April 1st of 1996, protease inhibitors were approved by the Federal, by the Food and Drug Administration. And, um, I started on them, started on the cocktail, it's actually a combination of three drugs. I started on that April 4th of 1996. We opened April 1st of 96, I opened the living room April 1st of 96. April 4th I started on the medications. Within two months, I was back to a healthy person. Wow. Um, Um, the stigma of AIDS didn't go away, but it was starting to be known as a manageable disease. Um, for me, it was always kind of like a... Um, I always had conflict of interest. Um, you being the director of an agency and having all these people come in and a lot of them were friends of mine you had to somehow keep yourself separated from them and you weren't, on one hand you were a client, and on the other hand you were a service provider. And it was a, I remember it being a difficult place to be because you, you had to have boundaries and you had to, how, how personally involved could I be with these people? And so it was, Kind of just a weird thing. You really, you really didn't fit into the service provider end of it, and although you were a service provider, but you were still a client, and, and it was just a strange place. It was a strange place for me, and um, I know my employees too. I, you know, I, I had several employees that were gay, or and or HIV positive too, and um, and so you know, there's parameters set up where where if you were a case manager, you, I didn't allow you to case manage people that were your friends. And if you were in a relationship or wanted to date a client, you needed to come to me and tell me and so that it was fully disclosed and stuff because otherwise it could be considered uh, you know, there's best be boundaries there between the service provider and 
so it was it was difficult to do I remember my partner I had a after my partner Jim died I had another partner for about five years and he was a client at Central Valley AIDS team and when his case manager came over to the living room he wanted to start getting his services at the living room and I was like I you know I don't know that you could do that because I'm director there and stuff and finally he was insistent and stuff so I said okay fine and my next in command I said okay here's how it works I said I am not allowed to go in and pull his file as far as any decisions go as far as his care goes that goes to you not to me I'm not allowed to make those decisions I can't it's a conflict of interest so we dealt with it, but it was it was it was always kind of an interesting thing to do. Uh, people, I, you know, I said that you know people. There's been so many people dying that you kind of you kind of I kind of put this shell around me, and uh, I didn't show much emotion uh, and stuff. Uh, just too many people dying, too much death. And, um, and then when the new drugs came out and people stopped dying, uh, I think I kind of let my guard down a bit. There was still a few people dying, but not like they were. And there was a good friend of mine who got sick and died. And uh, I was at his memorial service. And when they released the blues, I just started falling. I just started falling. It was like everybody, my brother to my lover to, had died again all over that minute. And I just, I remember I just turned around and I walked out and just kept going. It was, uh, it was a catharsis in many ways, but, um, for gay men in my generation, we lost a generation. We lost a generation. Uh, my friend Ron, who was the guy in Modesto who had moved to San Francisco with, uh, he had moved to Fresno too. A lot, of, a lot of my friends from San Francisco followed me here to Fresno. And uh, he died in 95, a year after my partner died. Um, and Mechanism of I can't feel this right now. Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't. It, it just it was a it was a time. Being gay during those years was not easy, and um, you know, uh, HIV wasn't something that you left in San Francisco, HIV was here in Fresno in full bloom. Um, there weren't the services that there were in the Bay Area, but we were trying. Um, some of the best people I've ever met were people in and around HIV and in, in and around the gay community. Um, the the um, humanitarianism of people, um, like the caring, the, um, uh, was incredible. Um, people People had a passion, and most people got involved because somebody they knew had either died or had contracted HIV. Um, but 
both mm. allies and, and people within the gay community itself? Yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of people in the gay community, there, and there's still a lot of gay people that were in total denial, and, um, but the gay community came together, um, and like I said, there was a maturing of the gay community. So I know there were already prides. How important was identity well, for AIDS? How did it shift? Well, pride, uh, you know, pride had been going on in San Francisco for since the early mid '80s, early '80s. Ah. I'm not sure what year San Francisco Pride started. When San Francisco Pride initially, when I was going to start going to San Francisco Pride, it was before AIDS, and it was just fun, fun, fun party. And then when AIDS happened, it became very political. Um, Fresno's first Pride was 1990. And um, I remember I carried a sign that said Open Heart for the first parade thing, and it lasted like five minutes, the parade, I think. Uh, there wasn't much going on. Um, the second year, the uh, San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus came down, San Francisco Marching Band came down, some friends of mine from San Francisco made a float and they brought it down and we had all the open heart people, it was a big heart, uh, marching in that, we put the float together here in the backyard and uh, there was a couple friends that were in the San Francisco Gay Marching Band. And uh, I think I had the whole band and the chorus here after the parade and stuff swimming that afternoon. We had a huge party. Um, and the open heart people, there was a lot of people here. Um, the pride, you know, started growing. The Ku Klux Klan would show up. That's weird. Yeah. And of course, I would go stand right next to them. I just, you know, I was such an asshole. I just have to stand right next to them. Um, and I guess they came two or three years. The last year they were there, Dykes on Bikes had, I remember they had made up these t shirts that said, had like a motorcycle wheel with like a spoke through it that said, no KKK. And um, and people were, were ready for them and harassed them. I think some I, if I remember right, somebody and I maybe I dreamt it. It seemed to me like somebody pulled one of their one of their hoods off. Mm. They really wore hoods there? Yeah, they had their, they were in their white robes and hoods. Wow. Yeah. Um, and Um, there were there was a segment of the gay community here in Fresno that we were activists, and um, you know it's funny. Before I when I left Fresno, my name was Jim because I didn't want anybody to know who I was. And I was so closeted. When I came back from San Francisco, there wasn't a closet big enough, you know for me. You know, I mean, I had been free for so many years there that, uh, and not, not that I went out in the street broadcasted it, and, you know, and stuff, but, you know, I wasn't going to take any crap from people either. Yeah. And, um, um, I still wasn't, uh, I just give Jeff Robinson so much credit for he's just been stable, stable person in this whole maturing of the gay community and, and the rights. Um, we, um, I don't know, I guess I got up to uh, 1990s. Oh, okay. I was talking about the living room. I was talking about, you know, we finally got the the 
education prevention and care plans together for the state of California. Um, and when we when we were introducing the education prevention plan, um, I had put together a meeting at the Fresno County Health Department for the six counties, Fresno, Madera, Merced, Kings, Tulare, and Mariposa counties for uh, people from their health departments to explain the education prevention plan and tell them how things were going to come down from the state and everything. <clears throat> there was a woman named Catherine Palmerville. She was the director of the uh, Central California Health Consortium and they were our fiscal agent for the HIV Care Consortium. But We had taken a break from the from the meeting and Catherine and I were out in the hallway talking and this African American man comes up to me and he introduces himself as the AIDS czar for Kings County mm -hmm. and uh, he says I want to shake your hand that's a great presentation so shakes my hand mm -hmm. and he says now how did you get into this and I said oh I said uh, I've got AIDS and he said oh Wow. Took two steps back and brushed off, cleaned his hand on his shirt. Wow. And it was like, okay, this guy's the AIDS czar of Kings County. Um, that had to be, I'm going to say that was 95, 96. Um, but there was still that much of a phobia around um, and there was a huge phobia just against gay people because of HIV AIDS um, it seemed like gay people had been making some progress and then when AIDS hit you know it kind of stopped for a while because people the general population was so afraid of gay people because of AIDS. And that, that first name that you mentioned, um, where is it? Before it was called HIV. GRID, Gay Related, Grid. Immune, De Gay -related okay. immune Deficiency. Did the general populace hear of it like that? Um, I imagine, but people hadn't re didn't really pay attention to the disease that didn't affect them. Mm. So it was... Yeah, I mean, it was the gay. It was well known in San Francisco. I don't know how well known it was in Fresno. I wasn't wasn't living here then, uh, but uh, it was very well known in the gay community in San Francisco. But um, as far as the general population goes, I don't know how aware they were of the of the whole thing at first. You know, it just didn't affect them and. Uh, and it was thought that if you weren't gay, you had nothing to worry about. It was a gay man's disease. Um, and, you know, even, even at that, within the gay community, a lot of younger gay men felt it was just an older gay man's disease as time progressed. Um, like I said, there in the late 90s, funding started to wane away. And, um, and of course, once the Republicans took, took charge again in Washington, um, the funding dwindled. And um, a lot of the education prevention went away. Uh, and finding funding became very difficult. Um, 2002, 2003. Anyway, um, I got I got diagnosed with cancer again, the second time, and uh, I was going to have to go through chemo again. And uh, I had been looking for grants to to I, I had grants to fund services. What I didn't have grants for was to 
administrative to to administer the agency uh, to pay like a director uh, or a bookkeeper or uh, uh, to do the annual audit uh, that you that we were required to do to pay the PGE bills to to do those sorts of things because lots of times grants a lot of grants didn't give you any money for administration and the grants that did didn't give you that much money for administration so you had to rely on trying to fundraise um, and trying to find other grants I, I couldn't find them and uh, when I did my projections I was running black ink but I my projections showed that showed me that within a year I'd be running red ink if it didn't do something and um, so that's when we started to look for a partner uh, because uh, once you start ready, running red ink, nobody wants you because you're losing money. And so the, that, that, the grants become even fewer after that, after you're... Well, when you're, you, know, you, have to, you have to be able to administer the grants. And, and people send it, people, people like to feel warm and fuzzy when they donate to nonprofits. So lots of times they'll earmark the money for food. So you can only use it for food. Well, I didn't need money for food. I had money for food through grants. I needed money to pay the auditor. I needed money to, you know, to run it. To run it. Yeah. To run the agency. Yeah. And so people don't understand that. They don't. It, it it doesn't make them feel warm and fuzzy to to donate to to pay those expenses, administrative costs. But you have to have, we were only running 11% administrative costs, so we weren't running a high administrative cost. But anyway, um, I told the board of directors, I said, we have to, if this agency is going to survive, we're going to have to find a partner that has some deep pockets. Otherwise, we'll be gone. We'll be, we won't have an aid service agency in Fresno. So. Um, I went to several places, and finally Westcare stepped up to the plate. We were already working with Westcare. They were doing, they had some education prevention grants, uh, and uh, so I guess it was 2003. Um, they took over the living room, and. Uh, you know, services still have, have dwindled a lot from from when they were there, but at least it's still there. Um, and they still provide their lunches. There's no more food pantry. There's uh, no more case management services. There's some education prevention services. Uh, the drop-in center's there. Um, but... Uh, but it's still there, and they do have some housing, um, and you know they've had to step in with their own funds many times in order to keep the agency going. Um, you know, about all I do these days is I MC the AIDS walk once a year. Um, but um, I don't do a whole lot anymore. I, I ended up with cancer again in 2009. I had some kind of radical surgery. Then um, I got very sick from the chemo that time. And then uh, then the cancer came back a year ago. And they said, well, you're not a candidate for chemo. So they took everything out, and they, I now have a colostomy that I, uh, on my side, which is fine. You know, it's still, you're still pretty spry. Yeah. You know, so, and I'm just starting to... Jeff kind of persuaded me to kind of get involved with Quistry 
which I'm glad I have. Uh, it's, I'm starting to get back out there a little bit. And stuff. I kind of moved away from a lot. Um, there's... I don't know. It's just... Being gay... There's been so many things that, uh, over the years, that uh, we've done. I remember one time in the Bay Area, I had a good friend, Jonesy Blackfish, who did, did a lot of drag, and he lived in this house in Sausalito that was a custom-built house for the Wrigley Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Midgets. Oh, wow. <laughs> or I guess little people, they call themselves midgets, is the politically correct term. But... Um, doing parties there stuff which was just outrageous do some mushrooms and go over there and be tripping on mushrooms and trying to get around this little place there and it just there, there was San Francisco there was so much freedom and I'm glad to see here in Fresno has become much freer and so much more accepted. Um, and I know it's not the entire community that's accepting, but there's a lot more of the community that's accepting. Um, uh, we we can be out, we can go places, we be and be visible that we couldn't be before. We can be ourselves. Uh, I'm very feeling, feeling very melancholy uh, right now, just talking about all this stuff. Uh, There, um, you know, you've got groups here like the IDC, the Imperial Dove Court, mm -hmm. the Drag Queens, mm -hmm. and they've always been very supportive of the community. Um, you got the transgender community now out there, and. I had a friend in San Francisco, Denise. We think we think Denise used to be Dennis before she was Denise. Mm -hmm. We never talked to her about that. She was, a, but she was a good friend. Um, but um, we think she was. We were ninety nine percent sure that that she was transgender, um, but never spoke of it back in the eighties there and we didn't ask we didn't ask um, you know it, it used to be there was gays and lesbians and you were either gay or you're lesbian and were those communities segregated yes they were but lesbian women lesbian, of course the lesbian women uh, some straight men like to say they're lesbians <laughs> but um, lesbians are the ones that started donating blood when gay men couldn't donate blood. Lesbians were the ones who started caring for gay men when they started getting sick. Um, like I said, AIDS is the worst and the best thing that ever happened to the gay community. You know? so tragic and it brought the community together it brought men and women of the community together um, you can no longer be immature, carefree I don't give a damn about 
anything, you know, because I have no responsibility. Mm-hmm. You had to grow up. And um, I don't know that we would have the equality that we have now, uh, the right to marry. Um, had it not been for HIV AIDS. Uh, It had such an impact on the on the entire community. Um, People were even afraid of lesbians, although lesbians were the least likely group to of anybody to to become infected with HIV, but people became afraid of lesbians just because of the gay connotation Mm -hmm. there and the association with HIV AIDS. Um, So out of, I don't know, it's been just a lot of things. There was the assassination of Harvey Milk. You know, that that had a, a profound effect on the gay community. Um, people used to segregate themselves, you know, as far as, uh, you know, Butch or Femme or, uh, you know, uh, lesbian, gay man, um, transgenders, you know, which is have been around for for a long time, but have only in recent years been recognized. Um, what I see these days is people embracing each other more than they more than they used to. Um, communities like Fresno just doing this quiz tree project is leaps and bounds from where we used to be at. Um, families, gay families, um, you know, and kids not being afraid to say they have two moms or two dads. And it to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know where else to go from here. I mean, just been, you know, and and I mean, I, I I talked about a lot of sadness here, but there's also a lot of really good times. A lot of really good times, a lot of just having fun, being able to, I am so happy I I got to be in San Francisco when I was in San Francisco. Um, it was really the place that I really found my, my own acceptance of myself, uh, being able to be normal, um, and I guess maybe that's what I what I'm seeing happening now in smaller communities is that gay people are able to be normal, just exist, exist, you know, um, and the fact that. If you were gay, you basically had to go to a gay bar. These days, you don't have to. Gay people are accepted in many different places. And we have our own cable channel. Yes. <laughs> Logo. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just the the. I guess maybe if I were to give a message to young gays is don't take for granted what we have right now because it hasn't been that long that we've had this stuff. Um, I 
And there's been a lot of people that have given a lot of sacrifices and fought very hard. Um, and we're still fighting. We're still in a fight. We're still in a fight. There's, there's justices on the Supreme Court that would like to take our right to marry away. There's, you know, states and communities that don't want us adopting kids. Um, you know, there's churches that are still doing conversion therapy. Anything else? Any other message you want to give? I can't think of it right now. I mean, um, I'll definitely come back for a second. Round? Yeah. Yeah.